I'd like all of us to welcome Dr. Hajimpour. Yes, close. very good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> who uh, joined the university um, at the end of last year um, as a, our clinical geneticist uh, in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, it's an area where we've been uh, sorely in need of some good help, and, and he has, I think, very quickly found that there's uh, a lot of patients that need his services and a lot of us that will rely on him for um, future help. He's got a very ex extensive um, history of uh, helping with medical genetics and, and most recently in California. Yes, I knew you so I Yeah, so um, I'd like everybody to welcome him here and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. So, I'm MJ Hajinko. I was just hired in November last year. I'm a clinical geneticist and clinical cytogeneticist. I was at the, on the faculty of University of Iowa. Uh, and before that, uh, I was uh, in California, Children's Hospital, and also in uh, Genetics Institute, which was uh, part of also Genzyme, doing mainly a lot of prenatal genetics for a number of years. So uh, uh, my goal here is not just pediatrics, uh, pediatric genetics. I'm going to build up a medical genetics uh, program, including the pediatrics, adult, uh, and prenatal, cancer, everything. And uh, today, the presentation is just an overview of genetics from very, very beginning, let's say, uh, uh, all, although it is prenatal genetics, past, present and future, but in general I'm talking about uh, the whole genetics and medical genetics. And the past, uh, the discovery of DNA as a double helix was in 1953, just 60 years ago, but it seems with the fast pace that we have in genetics, so old now, it is kind of past. And right now, the uh, the gene sequencing and genome sequencing and exome sequencing, everything is sequencing these days and basically to find out about all different disorders and probably also at the molecular level and mutation level some treatment. And therefore, although we had, we finished the human genome project within 10 years, about 10 years ago or so, and I thought we know everything, but uh, we now know that there are a lot of things to just to find out, to learn, and to, uh, to discover. So it, it continues uh, con to the future. All right. Now, I don't have anything to disclose. So if we go to the very beginning, 13.8 million years ago, there was nothing at the beginning, just uh, coldness, darkness, and space. If you can Im imagine nothingness, but there was something, space, coldness, and darkness. And then the Big Bang. And then formation, and formation of stars, and planets, and everything. And after nine billion years, about four and a half billion years ago, the Earth started to form. So we are talking about uh, from the beginning, uh, four and a half million, billion years ago, after two and a half billion years, just the first uh, kind of uh, uh, organ organic structures started to build up. And uh, another uh, million year, billion years later, we had the prokaryotes. And again, another billion years later, we had eukaryotes and multicellular uh, uh, being. And basically, another 800 million years passed, and then we had all different animals and dinosaurs. Another 135 million years later, we had all the animals, uh, creatures all formed in in land, in uh, water, and uh, air. So, uh, and another 60 million years later, gradually, 5 million, million years ago, 
where human or human it started to form, and it took another three million years until we have the kind of Homo sapiens, and another million later, the, the use of tools and uh, the fire probably. And again, million years later, about 10,000 years ago, uh, 11,000 years ago, we had some kind of civilization to, to start. So when we are talking about, uh, basically, uh, we are all started from this prokaryote to what we are right now, we are talking about two billion years ago, or two billion years of period of time. Now, and Every one of us, one after the other, all the animals again started from that prokaryote too. Mr. Darwin that uh, started uh, to ex explain the evolu evolution and uh, fitness, natural selection, that all these, uh, we are all related somehow, is what we are talking about two billion years. It is not a fast process, very slow. So Homo sapiens uh, that we are talking about to start uh, basically the human race uh, is uh, the, the only uh, extant human species, uh, species that could survive. And in between there are many other uh, Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthal and very uh, Homo erectus and many, many other branches which just are extinct now. So. Again, from here to, to human, we have about uh, four to five million years. And if you look at similarity of DNA between us, humans, uh, 99 and a half percent are similarities, and the difference that we have from each other is just based on the half a percent of, uh, of the uh, genome. And chimpanzee has 96 to 98% similarity to us. And the uh, cat calls humans, uh, the, the, the homolog homology is at the level of 60, 70, 80%. And uh, when we look at the mouse, 75% of human genes uh, have equivalent in mouse. And the other way around, 99% of mouse genes have equivalent in human. Even those that yeah, has 60%. So this data is from homogene.org. You can look at it. So not everybody accepts in evolution. Uh, and that's an ongoing on, uh, argument from before, now, and it's going to be in the present, but in the future. So this uh, doctor, neuro, neurosurgeon, our Republican candidate, quote, no one has ever demonstrated one species changing to another species. So unless you found the phosphorus remain of the elusive lizard man, you can keep your bogus evolution. So just um, as if the frog starts from the toe and changing gradually until uh, you get to the human. But this process, as we said, two billion years of process. So you may react something like that when you hear that, or something like this, no bad words. He can be nice, right? Oh, yeah. Good boy. <laughs> All right. So God knows, long time ago, if you go with the creation, uh, probably five million years ago, uh, in Eden we had the human uh, created by God, the lion and lioness and all the animals, everything perfect. You see the uh, Adam and Eve, they are perfect. White, blonde hair, probably blue eyes, that's a perfection. And uh, basically, but Mrs. Eve seduced Adam and they had the forbidden fruit. So they were thrown out probably five million years ago. Now, I don't know if the God was so angry to, to throw the out as one of these and told them go and evolve or as perfect human and basically these guys just were following the human, following human one after the other. So, uh, okay, 
come on, all right. The Darwin in 1859 had uh, the natural selection uh, uh, publication uh, and basically uh, 1859. He, what he was saying is not that any, any, any uh, animal who is uh, uh, strongest or more, more intelligent will survive. It is all uh, adaptation to the, uh, to the environment. Those who can adapt better could survive. And we see that even now, people say, why we don't see evolution? Actually, we are seeing that. Look at the sickle cell anemia. And basically, the mutation that happened in the hemoglobin beta chain was because of uh, uh, Malaria in the area in Africa, for example, those people who had the mutation to sickle cell uh, hemoglobin were resistant to malaria and they could survive. And actually, only two times this mutation happened uh, in two different parts of the, uh, of the world. And, uh, and basically, uh, uh, it is a matter of selection and those people who can survive because of these changes of the genome. Okay, and then 10 years, 10,000 years ago, civilization started. We had the Plateau, uh, Cetalis, the Leonardo, Da Vinci who was everything, the mathematician, the painter, the sculptors, the physicists, anatomists, everything. Uh, Galileo uh, introduced the heaven to us, the stars and planets, and uh, Newton, the gravity, and uh, Mendeley of the uh, table, uh, periodic table, and probably and Edison with all the thousands of these uh, inventions, and Einstein and Stephen Hawking's gate, and, and uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, basically, uh, the, the, uh, Stephen Hawking's who, into, uh, uh, had the theory of Big Bang and also the black hole, who is the only one who is holding the chair, Newton chair in Cambridge. And uh, he has a genetic condition, ALS, amyotrophic <coughs> lateral sclerosis, you know, a movement disorder, which is late onset, usually after 40 years of age. But he started at, it is little, in about uh, 10 years or so. He started early in the late 20s and then started with the legs, the movement disorder, he could not walk and then could not use the hands and then could not talk. The, it, it's not affecting the eye muscle or internal heart or, or uh, uh, internal uh, organs. And thanks to these two guys, a guy in um, California Institute of Technology, Caltech, made a computer that he can look at the words and letters and choose them and, and computer put them together and he can talk and he can write just by movement of the eyes. So basically the combination of computer uh, these days with science in all branches, they are not separable. And uh, then we have this guy, Mendel, who was Joan Mendel and later on called Gregor Mendel, uh, basically was in uh, the present day of Republic of Czech. And at age 21, he joined them to the Abbey uh, because he, didn't, he couldn't afford basically the tuition at the time. And uh, in, the, in the Abbey, they were just, uh, had, they had uh, courses and uh, physics uh, lectures and all those. And uh, he joined there mainly for that, not be, uh, just uh, because uh, of uh, being a monk. And uh, he uh, gradually started uh, just getting involved in uh, plants and the, the, the project that later on started uh, at age 34. And uh, eventually, late ten, 10 years later, uh, in 1866, at age 44, published the work. Basically, he was uh, looking at uh, seven characters in pea plant. He got the shape of the seeds and the uh, color of the flowers and the uh, height and all those. And uh, he, he basically noticed that you may have a 
character in, in, a ch in a one of the, the plant uh, from the parent, parent plants without having the characters seen in the parents. So, and open years and years of uh, uh, doing this, and he had many, many students doing the work for him. He just uh, published a, a paper explaining the inheritance uh, that each trait is the, the determined by something that now we know are genes, and they are passing on from the parents to children, and, and basically you may not see the trait in parents, but in the child or in later generation. And uh, for 34 years, this publication was not noticed at all, and in 1900, three scientists uh, uh, Corrins, uh, De Vries, and Chermak, probably there are three different countries, uh, Germany, England, French, probably. They, they had uh, this research, and they thought that they have uh, uh, come up with this uh, inheritance pattern of inheritance. And when they wanted to publish it, they found out that it was already published 34 years ago. And the new uh, science of genetics was uh, really born. Uh, Mendel died 16 years before the discovery of his law, uh, his uh, uh, Mendel's law. And uh, now we know that all the plants, animal, human, have some uh, uh, Mendelian pattern of in inheritance. So in his honor, basically, we call it Mendelian inheritance, the autosomal recessive dominant and X-linked. So, and gradually we, we progress and we apply that to hereditary, the human genetics, medical genetics, clinical genetics, so yeah, all these sub branches in genetics that, like any other specialty in medicine, now we have many, many, many branches and sub specialties. And uh, at the time, even uh, before the, the uh, uh, Mendel, Basically, physicians were seeing patients, and they were explaining the, the, the syndrome, the conditions. And most of the time, if it was an unknown condition, uh, was uh, 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 explained as a syndrome combination of findings that you see as a pattern, recurring pattern, then the name of the syndrome was going with the name of the physician or the person who was explaining that, like Down syndrome explained by uh, Dr. Down, uh, John Down, uh, in 1862. So actually, even uh, uh, at the same era that Darwin and Mendel were, but uh, before, uh, 30 years before the rediscovery of Mendel's law. So uh, McCusick, who was an uh, internal medicine uh, 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 geneticist at Johns Hopkins, and <coughs> He just recently died, and uh, uh, he put together in 1950s all these syndromes with which were uh, published and put them in a catalog, a book, which was a start with a small, very, a very small book. When I started my fellowship, it was one big book. At the end of my fellowship, it was two big books. At, in 10 years, it was four volumes, and eventually it had to go online. So basically, this catalog is Mendelian in hands of man, and every uh, published uh, established syndrome are cataloged in this. Uh, uh, and uh, when you see in some uh, publication in the parentheses they say meme number or omim number or macusic number, we are talking about the catalog number of this disorder. He was uh, actually chief of uh, editor, uh, chief editor until uh, he died actually, he had 90 or something. Then uh, about 100 years later, we know that uh, we, there are non-Mendelian inheritance, like an example, Angelman. We have uh, uh, microdeletion, uniparental diasomy, imprinting, and uh, basically uh, still uh, sometimes you may have the disorder of the gene. So let me put together 78% are not related to uh, gene, do, 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 do not follow the Mendelian inheritance. And uh, still 78, 1%, 79, 11, 90%. And still we don't know 10% of inheritance of Angelman syndrome. And as you know, it is a very uh, 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 
the, the uh, mental retardation, intellectual disability, and uh, they have uh, severe speech uh, delay and speech deficiency. And the point about this non mental inheritance in printing is that it now we know that based on the gene, expression of the gene, if it is on the paternal chromosome or maternal chromosome, we have uh, different conditions. For example, if the, the gene on the chromosome 15.1.2 is uh, deleted on the paternal chromosome, we get Prader-Willi syndrome. At the same location, if it is deleted in mother, maternal deletion, we get Angelman syndrome. We have different expression based on parent of origin of the gene. And then, uh, basically, the chromosomes are, uh, come in, uh, in, it, we, we, in 18th centuries, we know, 19th centuries, we knew that, uh, that there are chromosomes, and, uh, but uh, uh, again, at the, at the time, the first time, the, the what chromatin and mitosis was used by uh, Fleming, and chromosome is basically colored body uh, in the uh, a Greek world. And then uh, Sutton and uh, Bavari, they, 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 had, they thought that the inheritance somehow also related to chromosomes, and uh, Sutton was a cyto, uh, 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 histologist and put the cytology and genetic together, the name of cytology, cytogenetics came in, which is the study of chromosome. And in 1912, they thought that men have 47 chromosomes, women have 48 chromosomes. Painter, basically, in 1923, said that humans have 48 chromosomes. You should understand that at the time, we didn't have culture, we don't have the pain, the staining, or uh, we cannot uh, basically uh, have the, uh, the uh, uh, stimulate the division of the cells. What they, they were doing, they, were, they had to look at the chromosome on dividing cells, like the tissues from the testicles. So Painter was getting the testicle tissue from the prisoners who were in, incarcerated and fixed, and the, he was smashing the, the tissue and looking under the microscope directly. And uh, if you imagine 23, uh, eggplant or different soils are on top of each other, you cannot count them right. So for 33 years, the human chromosome was thought is, is uh, 48, and it was in all medical textbooks. And in 1952, Shu, who was a very uh, known uh, cytogeneticist, draw, the ideogram is drawing of the chromosome. Uh, drew all the uh, chromosomes of all 48 chromosomes. So uh, by accident, somebody used hypotonic instead of isotonic when they were fixed in the cells, and this caused that the chromosome bulge, were bulging swell and separated from each other. And then the, they had the cultures in to stop the metaphase, uh, uh, mitosis at metaphase, and basically in 1955, Chio, who was an Indonesian, American born Indonesian, and Levan, who was from Spain, working on Sweden, and had worked in the shoes lab, and uh, basically he invited Chio to Sweden, and they worked uh, on this combination of cultures in a hypotonic, and he was invited, invited in November 1955, in January 56, in three months, they published a paper that the chromosome was 46. But you cannot just easily go ahead and say, oh, you were wrong for 33 years. They had to be very conservative. We do not wish to generalize our present finding into a statement that the chromosomes, uh, the chromosome number man, in man, uh, man is 20, uh, 46, that's 2n, and, but it is hard just to avoid our, uh, avoid our findings. So what was a dogma for over 30 years had been uh, just uh, uh, overturned in one classic paper. <laughs> and then uh, later the phytohemoc to, to stimulate the cell division uh, was discovered. And these three cultures in hypotonic and hemoglobin are still being used. So uh, 
Then that, that we could look at the chromosomes, uh, uh, and that was in 1956, 1958, Lejeune uh, this, uh, thought that the chromosome number in uh, Down syndrome is 47, and the chromosome 21 is uh, 3 instead of 2, trisomy 21. And for that work, he was awarded the Kennedy Award in 1962. And then year by year, they looked at the other chromosome, Turner syndrome 1959, and uh, triple X and Kleinfelter and D group, because at the time they could not differentiate the chromosome, I, go, I will go over it. And uh, uh, trisomy 18 by uh, Edward and Noel and uh, Hungerfold the, discovered the market chromosome Philadelphia, which is uh, involved in CML. And later on, we know that this is a translocation 922. And Nora Hunger Ford, basically, they were just not even postdoc. They were uh, graduate students. They discovered that, and then they could get into their PhD program. And uh, Lyon, 1961, uh, 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 explained the uh, ex inactivation. And we knew that the uh, bar body that we knew before, that bar body is inactivated X. And then Lejeune, uh, two years, four, four, five years later, also explained the credo shot, which is related to uh, the deletion of chromosome five. And then, uh, but between that time, the, the uh, 58 to uh, 68 to 72, I mean, the uh, Lejeune that explained 58 until six to seven, nine years, we had only a, a handful of syndromes. Uh, explained, uh, you know, the 45X, XXX, Kleinfelter, XYY, and uh, trisomy 13, 18, and 21, and a point two of the breakage studies, breakage chromosome disorders. In 1968, then, Kasperson uh, had the knuckering, uh, knuckering uh, force and banding, and two years, uh, four years later, we had the GIMSA banding, G banding that you hear, and uh, from now on, they could actually identify the chromosomes. Uh, before the banding, they're all just uh, kind of black worms under the microscope, uh, and they, they, they just to uh, sort them, they were sorting them uh, based on the length, number one, longest one, and number 22, smallest one. The influence in, in to hybridization 10 years later and another 10 years later or 12, we had the uh, CGH. So you know, from now on, 68 now on, the, the pace is so fast in genetics, we cannot even follow. Now, uh, again, 68 to 70, oh, the, the, that was the basically non-banded chromosome. And you just put them together. Uh, based on the length, and uh, uh, because some of the chromosomes have the same length, they were just saying group B or C or whatever, they, those who had the same length. Therefore, plateau syndrome, which is trisomy 13, we know now, at the time was uh, just uh, trisomy of a group D chromosomes. And because at the time we didn't have the banding and could not differentiate this. The same thing with Edwards syndrome in group E. So after the banding, you see the chromosome was short, but they, they could uh, identify different uh, prominent region on the chromosomes. And uh, I explained a little bit how then uh, the, the nomenclature was started on the chromosome by a couple of the psychogenesis at the time from around the world, and they, they just uh, uh, established a committee and started the nomenclature. So there's a centromere. We have the short arm and long arm. The short arm, we call it P arm. P comes from the word petit, French word for small or short. And the Q was for the long arm, just the next letter in alphabet. And then we had these uh, prominent bands. They divided the chromosome to regions from centromere down, centromere up, region one, two, three. And then with better resolution, we saw that in, re in each region, we have bands, then they call the band uh, number, the band one, two, three in each region separately, center down, center up. And better resolution at 500 bands, we saw that each band has sub bands. Again, they number each band one, 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 two, three. And then 
again, at 800 band resolution, uh, we saw that the subband has sub subbands. So when you see a carrier top written at 22Q, and then 1.21, 1, 1 for example, this is the uh, deletion in uh, uh, DeGeorge velocardio uh, facial. You start with the chromosome number 22, the arm Q, then you region, band, subband, sub subband. Sub you have to read them separately. 22Q11.21, 1, 1 not Q11.22, because if you say that, it means that there are region number 11, subband number 21, which is, which is not such a thing. And this is an error that even some clinical geneticists make. So 1953, double helix by Craig and Watson, and uh, then, then at the time we found out that DNA, that the genes are not protein, basically they are the deoxyribonucleic nucleic acids, and uh, uh, basically they are self-replicating uh, and dividing. And uh, now we know that there's a backbone, uh, the deoxyribonucleic acid, and then the uh, phosphate band, and also the, the bases, uh, just adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Cytosine always attached to guanine, and adenine always to thymine. And in fact, in the chromosome, the banding, chromosome now, we know that they are DNA. If, if you open up a chromosome, the average size is about two meters of uh, DNA. And we have three billion cells. If you put our DNA, one person uh, from end to uh, head, one after each other, it can go to moon and come back eight times. This is the amount of DNA we have. So, uh, so in the in the in the banding, the dark band actually are basically more AT rich, and the light bands are CG rich. That's why we get different pattern of dark and light. And the genes are mainly in the light bands, no, and. Uh, less in the dark bands. So, and again, uh, 10 years later, we had uh, uh, molecular cytogenetics as fish, and uh, it is uh, first started with uh, using the probe uh, uh, tagged with radioactive, and later on, 1976, with Fleurs and I, and uh, uh, basically you, the way you do it, uh, you just uh, open up, uh, uh, denature the, 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 uh, the DNA uh, double helix, and then open up and you attach a probe, a known probe, for example, for the area of interest, a deletion in chromosome 5 or 15, and then you tag it with fluorescent, and basically if you see two signals, you don't have any deletion, or uh, if uh, you see one signal is deletion, or we, if you use the probe uh, at the break, uh, two sides of the break uh, on the chromosome like 922, uh, you can see the translocation. Like in this case, which is Philadelphia chromosome, there you have the fusion of uh, 22 and uh, terminal end of nine as Philadelphia chromosome, this is normal 22 and normal nine. You can do it on the metaphase, and therefore you can identify the chromosome involved, or you can do it, uh, and for this you need a culture, uh, in 48, for, uh, 72 hours you can have the results, or you can do it on the interface directly on the blood, and uh, in 24 hours you have the results. That's why when you suspect that uh, Down syndrome, you just send fish for 21, and it immediately, uh, next day, you have the results. And then, Further progress, we could paint the chromosomes. You can paint uh, the chromosome in different colors, and basically now we have a kind of a, a, a cocktail of all the probes, and we can study all the, let's say, the cancer MDS uh, cocktail panel for multiple, multiple genes. So, and then uh, we had comparative genomic, genomic hybridization, and uh, the, uh, it is a, so uh, easy. The, the area of interest you have for, from the patient and uh, uh, control normal, if you tag the normal with the red and uh, the patient with the 
uh, green. If they are equal number, you put the equal number of the DNA from both. And if uh, the, the, that area of interest are equal in number, basically the combination will, you, will give you a yellow color. If there are more of green, which is patient, therefore you have the kind of duplication. If you have less, you have uh, deletion. And it can be done on the slide on the chromosome, and you can see where it is. And now with the use of oligonucleotide and all the uh, single nucleotide, they can look at the whole chromosome. And uh, right now, the chromosome marker array is the first year testing of a patient, a baby that I will see with multiple congenital anomaly and uh, or in the child uh, ASD, autism, or developmental delay. Now, it is, uh, uh, again, uh, even this technique is getting better and better. And some of the lab, they have uh, up to two, mil two and a half million uh, SNP, which is a uh, single nucleotide, and also uh, up to one million oligonucleotides. They, they can look at every single part of the chromosome. And uh, basically, here, for example, all the, this is so automated. The red one is the duplication, and the, the blue one is deletion. And they can open up. Uh, the doesn't move. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, if, if uh, okay, then. Uh, you can actually extend the area of interest here and look at that area, even go up to the base pair. Now, when, when you see the chromosome marker array result, you see uh, array and then chromosome number and then print is a, a bunch of uh, numbers, which are nine-figure numbers sometimes. These are the, the location of the base pair. So with this coordinate, we know exactly where the deletion, duplication is. And then, basically, when I get the result with cytogeneticists, uh, uh, they go next. And they, they, we just put them uh, in some databases and, uh, and, uh, and to see what genes are over there and if these genes are pathogenic, if these genes are basically uh, uh, just benign. And when you get uh, these results, and most of the time you see that the report says variant of unknown significance. That's the problem that we have right now. Because it is a uh, new technology, not every variant is already, uh, uh, already this one. Uh, not every, every uh, variant is uh, already Explain. So when uh, we get these variants, uh, we have to just uh, uh, see what genes are over there and if they are uh, uh, related to any OMIM gene, the genes that are entered in the, that catalog, and if they are causing any disease. So uh, it is, uh, uh, again, the uh, CGH, comparative genomic hybridization, that was comparing the patient at the normal and to see if they the showed uh, uh, gain or loss, and uh, it uh, can be also done array by a SNP. And uh, any gain or loss usually can be picked up by this uh, technology, but if it is balanced because of the, the way that I explained, they are equal and they do not show any differences, the balanced translocation, for example, is not picked up. Any balanced rearrangement is not picked up. And the uniparental diazome with oligo is not picked up, but with SNP is picked up because of the similarity. And the uh, low level of mosaicism, less than 20% 20, 20 is not picked up. So uh, we are talking about interpretation. So we have to put the uh, clinical findings with the, with the uh, results. And 
uh, you know, I, I, I've done this. It, the, the, the director of the cytogenetics lab takes hours and hours to interpret these results. And please read, that, read them because uh, it is basically time consuming. They look at the different database to see if this uh, variant of unknown significance is uh, how important it is in regard to the genes over there and how, how, how much it is related to the phenotype. And uh, eventually, uh, when I get the VUS, the uh, very first thing is that in a child to do their parents to see if the, one of the parents is carry of the same uh, VUS. If the parent is uh, phenotypically normal and is carrying the VUS, then basically it is not contributing to the phenotype. If uh, the, it is the novo in the child, then I will look at the genes and then uh, basically uh, sometimes we have to report it because uh, when I see a patient with the, this VUS and I don't find anything in literature that related to VUS causing disease, two weeks later, one month later, if I see the same VUS in another patient, I still check the database because it really happened in the next day something published that, okay, this VUS is related to this condition. So it is an ongoing process right now. Okay, getting to prenatal uh, screening and uh, prenatal diagnosis. You know the prenatal diagnosis of uh, invasive procedures, amnio, CBS, fetal blood sampling, and PDG, pre-implantation diagnosis testing, and the screening, basically first trimester or second trimester, ultrasound, and all these biochemical, uh, the AFP, uh, and other markers. We will go over them. And uh, going with the history, 1960s, we were doing some amniocentesis. In the 1970s, we did uh, the amnio for uh, uh, advanced maternal age. And in 1980s, actually, AFP and then triple screening. It started with AFP just uh, to pick up the neural tube defects, open neural tube defects. And they started in England, they looked at the amniotic fluid that they, they, they had stored, and they found out that, okay, the F is increased in neural tube defects, and they started with that. And then later on, we, the, we saw that the low AF is associated with Down syndrome, and then we looked at other markers, and now at this time, we have triple screening, quad screening, panda screening, and uh, based on different markers, and then we added the ultrasound, which is very important. And uh, all these together will increase the sensitivity of the test and lower the false positive results. So in 1990s, we had the first trimester uh, screening with uh, 80 to 85 percent uh, sensitivity and false positive of 5 percent. And sequential screening that I think we are doing in uh, Tennessee is uh, uh, basically a, a good uh, high sensitivity tests and lower uh, false positive. And now, just five years ago, non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, uh, which should not be called diagnosis. It is not a diagnosis, it is a screening test. Non-invasive prenatal screening, P, uh, NIPS, not NIPT. So uh, indications are basically that well, it was advanced maternal age before, but now there are, uh, uh, you know, the screening is com comes in. Now the previous child with abnormality or a translocation in parents and abnormal fetal ultrasound, and you are all aware of this. At the time of prenatal testing, amnio or CBS, half of the chromosome abnormalities are Down syndrome, trisomy 21, and at birth also, about half of the half a percent total chromosome is Down syndrome. But these ratios are different at birth. So uh, trisomy 18, 13, uh, 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 and then uh, sex chromosome abnormalities and uh, other rare, the 16 percent. So by screening, therefore, we, we mean that uh, uh, we just uh, uh, calculate or uh, come up with a risk or increase risk or decrease risk, not uh, diagnosis. A diagnosis, obviously, is by uh, doing the invasive procedures. So the, in, in the 1970s, 5% of women had an age over 35 
and uh, basically that 5% uh, con were contributed 30% of Down syndrome. So 70% of Down syndrome were born to younger age group. Gradually, women got into the workforce, and basically, because of career and everything, uh, the age of uh, uh, reproduction increased, and nowadays it is about 20% of pregnancies are over the age 35, and then they contribute to half of the Down syndrome in this age group. And uh, the, the uh, second trimester, um, uh, screening basically AFP, unconjugated estriol, and uh, uh, free beta HCG will give you about 60 to 70 percent uh, 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 detectability, and the false was about 5 percent. Screening uh, at the first trimester uh, with PAP A, and also considering the, uh, taking into uh, calculation the, the nuchal uh, translucency and fetal heart rate, and uh, that these uh, ultrasound f markers are adding up, and uh, basically it will increase the accuracy of the uh, detectability of the test. It goes up to 90% for trimester plus the ultrasound with lower false positive. So usually beta HCG is uh, high, intrazoo 21, and the PAP is, uh, is low, and uh, uh, detection rate would be 65% for these two and uh, without the ultrasound. And 5% uh, false positive. So uh, it is better to do the screening around 10 to 11 weeks uh, and do the ultrasound at 12 weeks. That's the maximum gain you get. And with the screening, you may pick up other chromosome abnormalities, 18, 13 Turner, even some other rare Chromosome abnormalities are common. So the new markers in uh, ultrasound, you know better. All these uh, basically uh, uh, by themselves alone even have a higher, higher uh, sensitivity or detectability for the uh, f fetal anomalies. So. Now, this is uh, a different uh, way to use the, pre the first uh, trimester screening and second trimester screening. Uh, this is the integrated uh, full anterior test, also some measurement and nuchal uh, translucency and serum analysis at uh, you know, first trimester 10 to uh, 13, and which uh, 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 then the second trimester done AFP, uh, UE3 and HCG, and in here we had a quad test. And detection rate goes to 85 to 50, 95. And however, in this uh, format, you, you just keep uh, the results of the first trimester, uh, you withhold uh, until the quad test is completed. It has lowest false positive uh, rate. Now, the sequential that I assume it is uh, done in uh, Tennessee, uh, performing at the uh, first trimester the screening and then uh, based on the results, one, they're so abnormal and plus probably uh, also some finding, 1% are uh, offered the test after the screening. 99% just go ahead and uh, do the, go to the, uh, continue the pregnancy and do the second trimester. Uh, and then uh, for the, that 1% using the first phase of screening, uh, the uh, CVS or it is uh, at 10, 11 CVS can be offered because it's too early for amnio. And uh, if it is not in that category, uh, then uh, they go to quad test. So uh, this is another uh, way to do it, contingent testing, first trimester screening, and uh, there are three risk cutoff. One percent will go to uh, invasive uh, testing, and 84 uh, percent are so negative, uh, they just uh, don't do any additional testing, and 15 percent are uh, questionable, they go to the quad testing. Uh, each state has different uh, approach. 
the NTD, you know, and uh, the normal uh, size changes with gestational age, but uh, basically uh, the uh, measurements are around uh, 11 and a half week to 11 weeks of gestation. And uh, uh, at the time, the CRL has to be 45 to 84. Other than the, uh, the nuclear transition, other than the, the chromosome abnormalities, uh, the trisomy 21, also trisomy 13, uh, ternary triploidy, sex chromosomes, and other abnormalities uh, like cardiac and structural abnormalities are uh, associated with that. So uh, when you have 3.5 mm, the ACOG recommendation is to go for level two sono. And these are different pattern of uh, up and down for these markers based on the chromosome abnormalities. And then we get to the non-invasive prenatal, which is the new things. And uh, uh, the, at the time in 1990s, actually I was involved in it, uh, in it to try to separate the fetal cells in the mother's blood. The number of fetal cells in the mother's blood circulating in the mother's blood is very low. The problem is that the cells from previous pregnancies are, can be still in the mother, mother's blood, so it was not accurate. And also, because of low number, just uh, sorting all of those uh, was very difficult. Then Law found out uh, uh, that in cancer patients, there are cancer DNA, cancer cell DNA in the, in the patient's blood. And applied that to the women and just using the uh, male pregnancies uh, and using the markers for Y chromosome, they could detect uh, correctly about uh, 7 to 80 percent. And uh, that was uh, uh, later, uh, we know that uh, at the beginning we thought that 3 to 6 percent are the fetal DNA in the maternal blood. But now we know that it is about, about uh, 10 percent average and it is uh, basically consistent in 10 weeks of uh, gestation, but it starts from five weeks. But this is a, this is a very important part. The half time is 15 minutes, and within two hours after the uh, delivery, it is gone. There is no problem with the previous pregnancy's DNA. It is not there anymore. So in 2007, we started that in 2008. Uh, you know, 2007, those uh, just uh, picked up the male fetuses based on the uh, uh, fetal DNA in the mother's blood. In 2008, uh, uh, they could apply that to 20, trisomy 21 using the different uh, molecular technique PCR. Mainly, we use uh, what we call MPS, the massive uh, parallel sequencing. And based on the pattern of the bases, you can say which chromosome uh, those uh, the segments are coming from. And uh, basically, you can pick up the trisomy 21, but you cannot say if it is paternal or maternal. And actually, it doesn't matter. So going with all these screening tests, uh, you see that when we get to uh, cell-free uh, DNA, the NIPs, the accuracy that typically goes high to 98%, sublabs claim 99%, and very low uh, false positive or negative. Uh, and then we started with 79, 87%, and with sequential 88, 94%. So it is not a bad test. But uh, still, uh, uh, the, uh, the recommendation is that in addition to this screening test, uh, uh, the, the NIMS later on, we have to do all this screening as well. So ACOG uh, recommendation in 2012 was that it is the most of the NIPT, cell-free fetal DNA uh, sequencing or screening is a, a very effective way. And the patient should have counseling before the uh, test and uh, after the test if it is positive, And always we have to verify the results. And the same in 2015. And Positive results require confirmation. Therefore, that is considered a screening test, not diagnostic. And uh, 
because some of the lab just uh, just uh, take out the, uh, the those patients that they had the, they didn't have uh, uh, conclusive results, and then to increase the sensitivity of the test. So, uh, but uh, that not, might not be the case. So still, ACOG says, but other than NIPS, again, all these T should be changed to S. Uh, all these uh, screening tests, uh, studies that I, we talked about should be done because they may pick up uh, many other things. And then we come with pre-implantation. You know how it is done. IVF is at the uh, uh, day three. You can take one cell out. At day five, you can take a couple of them out, look at some uh, do some molecular or fish testing and transfer the unaffected one to, to the woman. So usually right now we do this uh, for those women who are at high risk for an autosomal recessive or dominant condition and we know exactly the mutation and we can test uh, directly for that. Or there's a translocation, you can do fish. And, uh, and but Gradually, in the future, all this technology, the, CA, the chromosome marker array, the molecular testing, will be so advanced that you can uh, basically, and the cost will be so low that you screen everybody. And uh, look at the genome uh, uh, sequencing. At the beginning, t a 10 years projects, over $10 billion. Now that I just uh, read that they have a supercomputer, can do the, the whole genome sequencing in eight minutes. So uh, this is where we are heading. And uh, PDD, uh, PDG, you know, that you do the stimulation at uh, uh, day 12, and you do the, uh, t t t take the egg and sperm, and then after three days, you can check uh, one of the cells. And uh, then the, met the different methods are used for, uh, for testing the, the, that single cell and uh, still fish array. It's so based on the abnormalities. You choose the, what you want to do. So uh, going all the way, uh, 1970s, we had the amnio, and uh, uh, 1980s, we could apply fish to chromosome study. And uh, it is in regard to the PDG in 19. 90, they did uh, sorted, uh, they did a fish on uh, PD, PDG and uh, PGD, prenatal genetic diagnosis. And then uh, in recently, 2010, they had a first delivery after the array uh, study, CGH uh, in PGD. So, coming together again, past, we had DNA. Before that, we had Newton with the gravity and then Einstein present. Still, we are doing sequencing, sequencing, sequencing. And we still have people who don't believe uh, in uh, natural selection or evolution. And we have this guy at the present. And we are still digging and digging and digging. And future Newton is going to use a computer. It's ironic, it is an Apple type of phone. And uh, then everything is going to be computerized, automated, and odd things happen. Like we will have President Donald Trump. OK. I don't know one million years from here how we are going to be, but probably 100 years or sometimes uh, in the future, probably we are all computers. And or in a way, everything is so automated, like the Dr. McCoy in Star Trek, you can have a handheld computer, you diagnose at the molecular level what the patient has, correct the gene defects. Thank you now. Those guys following the human? <laughs> Got tired. Just to stop following me. I don't know. We have time for the, the two questions I had, or? Uh, maybe one of them would be great. 
Okay, that this is actual uh, very uh, good case. This is uh, this was actual case, my case. So I was doing the uh, cytogenetics and I was doing also clinical. So amnesis was done because of a, a high HCG and uh, by AFP testing the expanded AFP, and then uh, we found trisomy 16 in three different culture, independent culture. By definition. If uh, it is in three independent culture, especially with the in situ method colonies, it is a real mosaicism. Because if it was artifact, you at most you see it in one colony in one culture, or at least just uh, in one culture. And uh, so the question is, uh, if this is a true mosaicism, I just said that it is, this is a uh, uh, culture artifact and not true mosaicism, which is not true, and patient, because again, we saw that in three different cultures, uh, and patients should have genetic counseling to explain the finding and offer additional testing like repeat mammal synthesis and POPs, and uh, basically provide genetic counseling and encourage termination. The D's are uh, obviously wrong, A and C. So I did the genetic counseling, very nice lady, mother, and uh, she decided for repeating the amnio. So we did repeat the amnio. Trisom 16, you know, is uh, not surviving. It's the full trisomy 16. It is the uh, most common autosomal trisomy in abortus tissues. Almost 50% of our tissues are trisomy 16. So it is not a chromosome abnormality that the fetus can survive. But in the mosaic form, uh, this is kind of uh, one of the uh, uh, very early uh, publications on trisomy 16 mosaicism. So, uh, uh, and the patient decided uh, after the counseling to repeat the amnio. We did uh, amnio and in 200 cells, no trisomy 16 was found, and none of the cultures. So uh, again, an agent counseling personally I did, and the patient decided for POPs, uh, preumbilical uh, uh, blood sampling, and in 100 cells, one cell was trisomy 16. But by definition, you have to have at least in 100 cells, two cells to say it is mosaic finding. So it, is, it remains uh, basically unknown uh, at that time that if the patient has mosaicism or not. So uh, basically, uh, the baby was born. I examined the baby. There was some uh, mild asymmetry and some cathode spots, nothing else, not major dysmorphic features. And uh, uh, I did the blood, no trisomy 16. I did the skin biopsy, no trisomy 16 in skin biopsy. And uh, again, a year later, I did another skin biopsy, no trisomy 16. So uh, then a paper came out uh, by Fletcher, referring to my paper that, OK, I had the prenatal trisomy 16 not confirmed. So I called back the patient at age two and a half and do another skin biopsy on the border of the, those hyperpigmentation and the normal skin. Usually with the uh, chromosome mosaicism, autosomal mosaicism, you get asymmetry and cafeolia spots, usually it's, uh, one side of the body. And uh, at the two and a half years of age or 28 months, the baby uh, uh, had uh, more obvious asymmetry, more cafeolia spots, a little bit delay. So clinically, we had to say that he had uh, trisomy mosaicism. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, then I had uh, uh, fish technology available. We looked at 800 cells. And it was not automated. We, should, we had to count them one by one. And 24 cells were trisomy 16. So. Uh, and this is the baby, it's a cute baby at uh, 20, 28 months. You see the asymmetry, both ears, the face. It was the whole body asymmetric, but very, very mild. And uh, 
talking uh, a little delayed, but not much in the, at the level of learning disability. And, uh, and uh, uh, careful as what. Otherwise, fine, my mother was so happy, kept the pregnancy. However, not every trisomistic mosaic will be so mild, depending on the rate of mosaicism and also the distribution of the cells. Uh, the, 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 the point is that at the time of, uh, after the conception and uh, at the time of blast blastomere with 16 cells, uh, they are not differentiated. Uh, how many cells go to the fetus, how many make the fetus, how many cells the placenta? About three to four cells only make the fetus. 11, 12 cells makes the placenta and support tissues. So if a mosaicism happens after the postzygotic, depending on the distribution of these cells, all may go to placenta, or all may go to fetus, or distribute to both, or uh, you know, a, a, it can be in different ratio in different tissues of the body based on uh, differentiation of those cells. So, so we have the, uh, the confined placental mosaicism, which means that basically uh, all the trisomic cells went, went to, uh, to placenta. But even that will give you some problem. Sometimes you may not see the trisomy in the fetus or the baby because of what we call trisomy rescue. The trisomy three chromosome 61, one of them is lost in the cell division. You have only two chromosome 16. But you may lose that extra chromosome which is coming from one of the parents that has a single chromosome contributed, and then you get uniparental diosomy for that chromosome. And that also causes a problem. And then the, another paper came out on, on this case and uh, 11 other cases. We studied the uniparental diosomy and what three of them had that. So they may have severe congenital anomalies and heart problem and delay and IUGR. So this is the second question, very important, the, uh, regarding the NIPs. So they did the NIPs. So that's why the ACOG says it is a screening, not diagnostic. The, they found the trisomy 13, but uh, they could not find it in amnio. And uh, basically, uh, then what to do? Is it a trisomy 13 mosaicism or not? And, uh, uh, the question is if it was a false positive finding and no invasive prior diagnosis should be done, which is wrong. The recommendation is always do the uh, confirming, confirmatory testing. The invasive prenatal diagnosis should be a true amniocentesis, not CVS, because the amniotic cells are uh, originated from different tissues in the body, the gut, the kidney, the mouth, uh, the skin, and this is a better representative of different tissues. The, the uh, CVS is kind of uh, mainly the sensorium, uh, the main core of the uh, placenta uh, villi. And, uh, and we saw that it might be just confined placental mosaicism if you do CVS and you find it, still you don't know if the baby has it or not. Uh, if uh, uh, the Amniocentesis does not show any trisomy 13 mosaicism. The baby may still have trisomy 13 mosaicism and POPs should be offered. This could become confined placental mosaicism. However, postnatal cytogenic studies on blood and skin cells should be performed. Clinical evaluation long term follow up. This is an actual case published, and uh, basically, after birth, they could not find the trisomy 13. But based on what I said, still. There is a question that in some tissues somewhere, uh, the trisomy 13 might be one of the tissues, and uh, then we have to do, go with the clinical findings. Thank you.